Welcome to pre-assessments, differentiation strategies for high-end learners. Assessment is a critical element for success in your classroom because it is essential for planning for your differences. It determines when, where, and how we might need to differentiate instruction. We hope this presentation will help you as a general education teacher or as a gifted specialist to properly pre-assess your student's knowledge of a particular topic or unit. In this presentation, we will consider how pre-assessment data, this is an increased student learning, and we will examine formal and informal strategies to help you measure your student's knowledge level at the beginning of whatever unit that you're about to cover in your classroom. Reassessment plays a critical role in your ability to differentiate instruction. Without pre-assessment, you do not know the preparedness of your students for new learning, the specific learning differences among your students, or where to begin devising new curriculum goals. Why is pre-assessment important? In meeting the needs of gifted learners, the Alabama Administrative Code lists placement and service delivery options for gifted students. Gifted students' need for complexity and accelerated pacing must be accommodated for in the general education program. Accommodations may include strategies such as flexible skills grouping, cluster grouping with differentiation, curriculum compacting, subject and grade acceleration, dual enrollment, and advanced classes. Each LEA must establish and implement a procedure for considering any requests for subject and grade acceleration. The procedures must be approved by the State Department of Education and will be included in the LEA plan for gifting. In order to meet the needs of all learners, in particular, your high-end learners, Pre-assessment is a way to differentiate your instruction to best meet those needs of that student. Using pre-assessments and narrowing down your student's strengths and weaknesses will help determine those flexible skills groups and cluster groups, as well as curriculum compacting to allow those high-end learners to compact out of something that they're already familiar with. You need to either choose or design pre-assessments to identify your students' prior knowledge. The results of those pre-assessments are vital in designing lessons and groupings. Remember, just as with your regular students, gifted students' ability levels vary depending on the individual. A particular gifted student may exhibit strengths in one area, struggle in another area. Here are some considerations to take into order when creating formal pre-assessments. Does it provide an adequate demonstration of concepts, skills, and processes that students are expected to acquire by the end of the unit? Does it allow students with a variety of learning preferences to determine what they know? Given their language factors, do English language learners have an adequate opportunity to understand and complete the assignment? Do the items assess what you want to measure? The process, the content, or the product? Do the items clearly align with the end of the unit test or culminating project to be used as your summative assessment? Here are some pre-assessment advantages. When you use pre-assessment, you understand and know the readiness level of your students. It helps you avoid teaching what students already know, which fosters underachievement in your gifted population. 
It helps you guide your instruction to challenge your students. Students are motivated. It helps you use planning and instructional time more effectively. And it helps you plan for meaningful learning opportunities to happen within your classroom. There are numerous advantages to pre-assessing. It's important to know the readiness level of your students. And from a gifted perspective, it's vital to know and to allow those high-end learners the opportunity to show their knowledge level and provide alternative educational experiences for those students. This helps prevent underachievement. If gifted students are able to prove through formal or informal pre-assessments that they are experts or have mastered that particular skill and are able to move on to another topic or project. This also helps with boredom and often behavioral issues within the classroom. In contrast, it may also provide you opportunities to focus on small group learning with those students who are struggling. So essentially, it's a win win situation for the teacher and for the gifted student. Here are some examples of both formal and informal strategies used in pre-assessing students. Most of us are familiar with many of these strategies, especially the formal strategies. If you're not familiar with some of these, please invite the gifted specialist to your classroom to model some of these strategies. Let's take a more detailed look at formal pre-assessment strategies. Remember, most textbooks have pre-assessments included that help identify strengths and weaknesses and skill level. Those pre-packaged pre-assessments may be valuable to help with your time management and with your planning. In doing structured observations, you may be able to pre-assess um, students under particular circumstances. You need to think about what specifically you want to observe and then set up a learning task that will, that will enable you to do so. For example, if you want to determine whether your students remember and can apply the scientific method, you would set up a lab in which you could observe them at work who competently goes through the process, who struggles, who is completely baffled or still confused about what you're trying to teach. Journal prompts and written responses are also good. Keep in mind that writing skills will affect your students' ability to convey what they know and understand. At early stages of the show me prompts, yes, no questions, list or label items, and sometimes with short phrases or answers. Students in your lower elementary grades are not going to be able to respond in those full sentences or paragraphs. And we'll dive a little bit more into that specifically in a few minutes. Here are some specific examples specific examples for using pre-assessment across different curriculum areas. And this figure 3.3 gives you a curriculum area. They give you the primary focus of your pre-assessment, and then they give you specific strategies that you may use if you're looking for some ideas. Notice the differences with language arts, you're incorporating writing or composing written products, oral responses, with math and science, you're doing a lot of demonstrations or sequencing, okay, music and art, that would be observing a performance or demonstrating a skill. And of course, with technology and IT business applications, you would be solving problems, sequencing steps, observing a performance.
let's take a look at some of the informal pre-assessment strategies that you might use in your class to better understand the knowledge level of your student. Topic webs are a great way to gauge knowledge on any particular topic or subject. It's important to remember that in using a topic web, this would help determine your grouping for the next portion of your unit. And if you're not familiar with topic webs, there's some directions highlighted in yellow. You are to divide your student to divide them four, ask all students to take five sticky notes. Individually, students will generate a list of at least five facts about your curriculum topic that you've listed. Students label each fact using a specific code. Students share those facts in small groups until all facts have been shared. Students review the facts and identify those that go together in some way. So you're classifying those. And then you use markers and flip to construct a web of major topics and subtopics with facts. And then you ask your students to post those webs in your classroom. And you can look at example or figure 3-5 here where you have amphibians and then you have the four characteristics around the word amphibians. Topic webs represent the visual spatial learning preferences of the multiple intelligence theory. Something also to consider with topic webs, because early readers and writers will be more limited in their ability to record their ideas. Primary webs may be completed as a large group activity. This would be a great time to invite your gifted specialist into your classroom to collaborate, observe, and listen to those conversations happening during those topic webs. You're going to record your student's response on large readable cards instead of sticky notes like you would ask your, your older grade levels to do. Think ahead when you're dealing with those younger students. Think ahead about um, how you will respond to inaccurate ideas when they're presented. Will you ask the class for a consensus on a suggested fact? Will you create a section labeled, let's check this out, or say, let's do a fact search on that later? Or will you accept the idea and then teach to it later so the misinformation is corrected? With your primary kids, once you have the ideas recorded, Ask your students to help you put those ideas into groups that are like ideas. And encourage them to label the group of cards, thus creating subtopics. And then you would model the construction of the web, asking your students to help you place the cards where they belong. And that might be something that you would be able to do with those younger or those lower grade levels. Walkabout charts are exciting for most students because they involve movement and interaction. They're also helpful in gathering information because your students initial when they respond to a question on the chart. And this is often much easier to measure than the topic webs that we just looked at. Okay, so if you look at some of the positives related to uh, walkabout charts, they're engaging and active. You consider your unit and you design four to six tasks or questions related to the topic. You distribute charts to your students. You have your students tour the room, locating one student as, at a time who, is, who has an answer to one of the questions on their walkabout charts. The student records the answer in the appropriate box and has the other student initial. And then you lead a class discussion about the topics on the chart and you review for understanding and for misinformation, noting your student experts and those who need additional support. And you can notice up here at the, on the sample that I included, the differences in the depth of those questions, name the parts of the plant, um, name the jobs of each plant part, so of course, each question, you could design it to be a little bit more in depth so that you could assess the ability levels there or the knowledge levels.
I've participated in several conferences where presenters have used walkabout charts to get us to know one another in the room, or they were looking for experts on a topic. And they are certainly a great way to, to assess those things, but they also allow for some flexibility of movement. Knowledge bar graphs are also a great way to assess. What you're gonna do is you're gonna provide a brief overview of some of the topics that will be included in whatever curriculum unit you're working on and you would post questions to clarify your topic. You would give students a sticky note and instruct them to write their name on the back of the note and have them individually place their notes on the section of the chart that represents their knowledge on the topic. By reviewing the resulting bar graph that you would have, the students would recognize the variation in their experiences and the differences in their knowledge base. And there's one on the bottom of this chart that on the bottom of chart three seven that shows like if you had a question, the students had no clue about, you know, the topic, or they might have heard of it, or they know a lot about it, or, you know, they're an expert on it. And you may want to pose some extra questions on a knowledge bar graph to further clarify your topic, like, can you name the planets in order according their, to their distance from the sun? If you, had a, if you had a bar graph that was asking about the planets, or can you list characteristics of different plant, planets? Can you um, tell me what creates a day and a night? Can you describe what causes season? So those, those questions that are more in depth will certainly help you to see the, um, see the knowledge levels, especially in those high-end learners. And it's just another quick and easy way to find your experts on those topics or on those units. Check-in slips are also a great way to pre-assess. I know I've used exit slips in my class before and check-in slips are a lot like that. Check-in slips are a set of two or three quick questions or tasks that students complete to provide a general sense of their background knowledge on the curriculum or topic. They're designed to give you a snapshot of students' understandings, and you're looking for your experts as well as those who potentially struggle. Some tips for using check-in slips with primary students. You may want to ask students to sketch versus write their ideas on check-in slips. For example, if you gave students a um, duplicated sheet of four identical drawings of like bare trees placed outside, um, placed inside four quadrants, you might ask students to sketch how a tree would look in the fall or the winter or the spring or the summer. You might also encourage them to include other things in their sketches to show you what else they know about the season. And that would be something that they could do with drawing where they didn't ha have to use any type of language other than the visual language to let you know how much knowledge they had of a particular area. <clears throat> visual organizers are also a concrete way to pre-assess strengths and weaknesses. Students who exhibit strengths in linguistic and visual spatial areas often do well with visual organizers. And I know you guys are all already familiar with those, but just to kind of refresh your memory, you can use frayer, diagrams, charts, timelines, storyboards, Venn diagrams, and character maps. You can also use a pre-assessment carousel. And a pre-assessment carousel is where students rotate um, through a set of posted topics or questions related to your curriculum unit. As students rotate to each workstation, they list what they already know about the topic. Again, this is a great way to pre-assess, but it would also be great at this particular time if you had an extra set of eyes or ears maybe an extra um, teacher that's with you in your grade level or invite the gifted specialist in so that person could record and observe some of the conversations that are going on at those stations.
online discussion boards. You could ask your students to comment on an online class discussion about a topic that you have listed for an upcoming unit. You could have students consider what they already know or what they would like to learn about the topic. And I've listed some prompts here for you. If you need some sentence starters, I know that. I learned this by, this makes me think of, the unit I would like to know. I'd enjoy this unit most if, or you may want to come up with sentence starters of your own. Since many teachers across the state are teaching virtually or doing a hybrid of virtual and face-to-face, -face, this is a great way to assess students' knowledge on topics and subject areas. Here are a few pre-assessment reminders. Pre-assessments must be clearly and specifically tied to what you want your students to know and learn. Use formal and informal pre-assessments at least two weeks before your class begins a unit. And that will help you have enough time to go ahead and plan your unit based on those pre-assessments that you did two weeks prior. Pre-assessments preview preview unit topics for your students, and they may reveal some insightful responses from some of your students. And pre-assessment is critical to the effective instruct to effective and instruction. Oh, I can't talk. Pre-assessment is critical to effective instructional planning. Remember to in order to truly meet the needs of your gifted learners, and all of your learners, it's essential to pre-assess and design instruction so that students will benefit. In using pre-assessment as a differentiation strategy, you are working to meet the individual needs of your students, but you're allowing those high-end gifted students an opportunity to show their knowledge and to move on to another area or topic for a time. And that leads me into my next topic of curriculum compacting. Stay tuned for an in-depth look at curriculum compacting and how you can use pre-assessments to allow those gifted learners to compact out of a subject or a topic or a unit. Compacting is a great way to meet the needs of your gifted learners. All information from this Google slide deck is taken directly from Making Differentiation a Habit how to ensure success in academically diverse classrooms. And this book has a wealth of knowledge on many, many differentiation strategies. If you'd like to purchase a copy, check out the link below. And if you have any more questions regarding differentiating your instruction using pre-assessments, I can be reached at ashley.strickland at alsde.edu, and my office number is 334-694-4782. Thanks, and I hope that something in this slide deck was helpful to you.